Welcome to the Voice of Counseling, presented by the American Counseling Association. This program is hosted by Dr. S. Kent Butler. This week's episode is current events from a humanistic counseling perspective and features Dr. Linwood G. Vereen. Welcome to the Voice of Counseling from the American Counseling Association. I am Dr. S. Kent Butler, and joining us today is a very good friend of mine, Dr. Linwood Vereen. Linwood is an Associate Professor of Counselor Education at Shippingsburg University. He is a longstanding member of the American Counseling Association, and his scholarly experiences are really looking into Black men in counselor education. He currently engages in professional and scholarly work focused on humanism as a central tenet of the professional counseling. Extensionalism, humor in counseling, clinical supervisor development, group dynamics, and mindfulness within the small group experience. His leadership positions within the field of professional counseling and counselor education include serving as the chair of the Western Region of the American Counseling Association, secretary for the Association for Counselor Education and Supervision, and believe it or not, with all that he does, he is a very, very proud father. So with that, let me bring in Dr. Linwood Vereen. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Dr. Butler. It's really good to see you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. It's been a long time. So it's been a minute. It's been a minute. Um, so you're doing okay in this pandemic and this this time? What's happening with you? That's a really interesting set of questions. Okay is a relative statement. Okay. Um, I think under the circumstances I'm doing as well as could be expected. I think what I mean by that is navigating the reality that in my own personhood, in my community, um, and going to branching out further than that, we're all living through an interesting series and set of trauma over the course of the last few years. And so navigating that is challenging, um, but what the last few years have shown, um, I've seen resilience, I feel like I've experienced that, and, um, so I think all in all, I think I'm doing pretty well. Thank you so much for asking. Good. It's been good, a challenging good. couple of years. Say that one more time. I said it's been a challenging couple of years. Yeah, it has been. And so you, you're, you're no stranger to challenges and getting through them successfully. Mm -hmm. We started our careers similar, similar um, time frame. Um, yes, if you sir. remember correctly, we were where? The University of Connecticut in the great uh, area of stores. Main in campus. the great area of stores, yes. Stores, Connecticut. Yes, so. yes, yes. Um, so you came in a little behind me, um, maybe a year or two, I guess, behind me. Uh, actually, I think just a bit more. You were a doctoral student when I started as a master's student. Oh, you were a master's student when I, I was, was a okay. master's student, yes. Uh, okay. I did okay. my undergrad and master's at UConn. Um, still a very proud alum. Yes. And so... And so then I, I got to be your supervisor. You did. Somehow I knew that was coming up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was a period in my life where I did have a doctoral supervisor who was Kent Butler. You're absolutely correct. Uh, interesting set of learning experiences for me. Um, and I think that among a number of others that I think really shaped my trajectory yeah. In terms of as a master's student, I had initially had this idea that I was going to get a professional degree uh, as a school counselor. Mm -hmm. I was going to go home to Bridgeport, Connecticut. Okay. I was going to somehow finagle some sort of financial uh, investments to buy a city block and develop a phenomenal community center. Um, when I grew up, there was a boys club that I frequented. Okay. And I had said to myself that one day I would go back and buy that block and turn that boys club into um, a community center. Okay. A place that met the needs of folks in my community, in my neighborhood, were one of the spaces where I grew up as a way of not only giving back, but giving forward, you know, so that idea of paying forward um, and not, you know, providing a future for a group of individuals and then life happened along the way 
And somehow I ended up not doing that, but instead going on to the University of Nevada to eventually take a PhD in, you know, we, it was counseling, counseling and educational psychology, of course, with the emphasis in counselor education. So yeah. that failed the plot to take over a block of, uh, you know, the great city of Bridgeport. So, so, so in, a, in a very real sense, though, you are now taking it to a whole other level. So I had that kind of same situation, right? So I wanted to get out of just being in a district. So I, mm -hmm. I was a school counselor as well. And I thought that my talents went further than just that district. If I can reach out to other individuals. So by virtue of this, you still are doing that city block, but you are reaching out in different ways because now your tentacles are in many city blocks. I think in some ways you're absolutely right. And I've thought about this and sometimes it's moved me to tears thinking about every year at every university that I've worked at, if we graduate on average 15 students, at the master's level, that's not even considering what doctoral students go on to do. Um, those are people that go out into their communities and they impact so many people on a broader level. And yes. so that is not lost on me. Yes. Um, I think the other part that's interesting is, even though I was training to become a professional school counselor, mm -hmm. while as a master's student, I never set foot in a school. I had an opportunity to do something different. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I know that program you were a part of. So yes, I, you had a little bit of something different to do. I did. And, and what it did is it set me up on a trajectory to uh, obtain a PhD and then eventually become a counselor educator. And I feel like that has indeed been the right path for me. Yeah. So can you tell me, did your sports background have anything to do with kind of your leadership pathway at this point? Can you see a connection there? And, and what 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 led you um, actually to get your master's degree anyway in the first place? Oh gosh, there are so many factors. Um, as an undergrad, I, I felt like I knew three things. Okay. I knew, I had three ideas of what I wanted to major in. And at that point in my life, it was the only thing that I really felt like I knew. I was either going to get a degree to become a physical therapist or to become what I thought at the time was a psychologist. And after some thought, I realized it was to get a degree in counseling. And the other was to do uh, what exercise and leisure sciences with an emphasis on therapeutic recreation. I self-selected out of physical therapy because of my inaptitude in the sciences. And it was a combination of a very dear friend of mine, Chris McCall, um, and then some other folks, uh, Michael Wilbur, Janice Wilbur, who helped convince me that I had a different trajectory and path. And that was the opening to the master's degree. Mike and Janice used to always talk about there's a window of opportunity. And when that window closes, you want to make sure you're on the right side of that window. And so for me, being on the right side of that window was entering into the master's program at the University of Connecticut um, almost on a dare. And what I mean by that is um, Janice Roberts Wilbur, I met at an, uh, some weekend in stores and she came up to me and said, oh, you're Linwood, I've heard a lot about you. And she used some very choice words that I will not repeat on this podcast, but she said, when are you gonna stop blank blanking around and get yourself into graduate school? And this was in April of I think 1994. And that summer I enrolled in summer school. Um, so it was, it was a new challenge. You know, you know, it's really funny. I think that was their pathway because they actually approached me on that same campus. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I don't know, maybe what they were doing was trying to build a program or whatever have you, but I they did were. get approached by them. I didn't think about their program until they actually approached me. So mm -hmm. they actually were instrumental in getting me to be in the counselor education world. So that's really interesting that you say that when somebody yeah. have similar similar pathways there. So can you talk a little bit about um, how all your experiences have now led you into the clinical world? You, you, you are the expert now. Um, so okay. can you talk about your clinical counseling experience and how that shapes your work in the association leadership? Oh, that's an interesting thing. The first thing that makes me giggle is anytime someone uses the word expert closely connected to my name. Um, <laughs> and I say that because and I'll, I'm still a student. 
there are still things that I want to learn, that I have to learn, that I feel that I need to learn, and I'm open to learning. And then there are also the things that I am oftentimes, uh, I don't know if fearful is the right word, but I still know that there are some challenges and some pushes. And so uh, I have been privileged to be around a group of folks who support me in that. And, you know, when you're talking about the clinical stuff, the times where I've worked as a professional counselor, I think bring a dynamic to my teaching that is otherwise not there. So first, I think it's the opportunity to bring real world experiences into the process. So if I'm in a practicum setting or an internship setting where I'm doing supervision, I have an opportunity to share some of my professional clinical experiences. And I see that as being helpful to not only my own continued growth and development, but to the students as well. One of the things that I think it engenders is this idea of professional development, continued growth as a professional counselor fits into that model of lifelong learning. Um, and that those are experiences that I've had at both the master's and doctoral level. At the doctoral level, what I think it has allowed me the opportunity to do is when I have opportunity to, because I try to make time once or twice a semester, not too often, but I do think it's important to do this. And I'll explain why in a second. I think it's really neat to have doctoral students as they're growing into the role of clinical supervisor to engage in looking at uh, what someone might consider advanced counseling and provide feedback and supervision as a way of their own growth and development into the role of counselor educator. And, and it, that is really important because it provides context. It also, I think, serves as a model for this is just one way that we could be continuing to do things that I think allows our profession to grow. As we continue to work as professional um, clinicians, as professional supervisors, in addition to being counselor educators, I think it allows, I'll speak for myself, it allows me to provide a more well-rounded learning experience for the students I work with. And I'm privileged now here at SHIP to work with a number of colleagues who also are consistently serving as professional counselors. And I feel like I see the impact on our students. You know, when we ask them, what, are, what professional conferences are you attending? What things are you doing to continue to grow um, into this role? What are you reading? What are you studying? I feel like I see some of the benefit based on those who, um, who are bringing these experiences into the classroom setting. So. All right, all right. So how does that tie into humanistic counseling? Oh gosh, um, that's an interesting way to put it. How does it tie into humanistic counseling? Um, I, I, I wanna play around with those words, but I won't in this moment. Okay. And I'll, how it ties in is when you look at the, uh, what we call our forces of counseling. And if we look at sort of our original set, one of the joys for me is that humanism is our third force of counseling and where that situates it as being the heart of counseling. Okay. And it's a way of being, it's a way of seeing, it's a way of interacting, it's a way of intervening. It's a way of seeing the individual as being wholly agentic. And I know this is a poor choice of words, but I haven't found any better, so please forgive me, as being the master or mistress of their own fate. And those are the two words that I need to work at, um, sort of, because they're not as inclusive as they could be. Um, the the architecture of your own fate. It's the individual being the owner of their own and, and uh, proprietor of their own fate. Yeah, the and that is challenging Okay, on many levels to see in our current times, in our past times, and also as we look toward our future. Okay. Because oftentimes I know I felt this personally and I can imagine what other people have experienced where I don't feel like I am the proprietor of my own fate. I feel like it's determined by other things. There are other determinants. And uh, it ties into, you know, back to your original question, it ties into humanism because I think what humanism does, humanistic counseling does, is it asks us to wrestle with these things. It asks us to look at these things based on all of the variables that we can see and then those that we can't. Uh, those that we can see when we look and sit across from another human being or another couple or in a group setting. And then those that we can't see. Um, 
those that constitute our dimensions of diversity, those that constitute our drive and strive for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and the, with, for me, it's with the idea of at the heart of that is I or you as an individual are the architect of all of those things, you. And that can be tough to grasp when one feels that they're being bullied online through social media, when they are racially profiled, when um, they walk into a classroom and they're one of, or, and I was noticing this this past week, um, you talked about the father thing and my children are a significant part of my life. I took a picture of my daughter with a group of her friends and it's not the first time that I've noticed that she's one of the only or one of few people of color in her community. And so I wonder what and how that will impact her as she continues to grow into this beautiful woman that I'm certain that she will become. Um, how she thinks, how she chooses to identify, um, all of those things that are really important to her continued growth and development. So how does that, I guess, you know, now that you bring that in, oh, bring you're working with your clients, you're working with yes. folks, narrative therapy and client storytelling um, comes to mind when you talk about that. Like I think about what yes. you're saying about your daughter and what her life will look like. Um, how does that filter in? I think it filters in because that I think is, can be seen as a catalyst for the individual being the architect of who they are. Mm -hmm. They are in this moment who they envision themselves being in the future, if they're future oriented. And then also, I think, tying in some of the context of their past yeah. to ultimately be grounded in who they are in this present moment. Right, and right, so right. narrative inquiry provides and allows simply for the opportunity for me to be the author, to create and to recreate this story, this narrative of who I am in this world and this space that I want to hold, this Your place that I want to occupy. Your and truth. so... In a counseling setting, what I feel like it allows is the person that I'm sitting across from to literally and figuratively take over okay. and allow me the opportunity as the helper in this situation to be along for the ride as a guide, as a voice, as a query. Tell me how that works for you. Say a little more about how you feel in this moment. Tell me how this impacts your relationship, your significant relationships. Right. So, you know, and, and to then hopefully go a little deeper into that. Um, so that's a way of helping to empower them? I think it's, I feel wholeheartedly it's a way and a pathway to empowerment. I think and feel that it is a way to engender a sense of ownership. Okay. Um, I think it also ties into allowing a person to become closer to their felt sense of value and meaning in the world. Uh, and I think it also allows them to begin to differentiate themselves from stories or narratives that they've heard that don't fit with who they are as a human. Or when somebody actually told them that they are, right? So again, that doesn't empower you when somebody is telling you who you are and they don't know you, right? Yes. Or the That's message that, that people perceive. So I think of, right. I currently have more daughters than sons. I think we're going to work at kind of halting there. But when I think about my daughters, I think about the messages that they hear from other people telling them who they are supposed to be, how right. they are supposed to look, how they are supposed to dress. Um, I think one of the ways in my own family, I work to sort of spin that or combat that is, uh, I'll use my 20 year old as an example. She does, she's a really amazing young woman. And I've asked her on, a numer on numerous occasions about what she does. Is she proud of what she's done? Is there anybody in her life who she wouldn't share this moment or event with? And I feel like as long as she can answer those, like, I'm proud of what I've done. I'm proud of the impact that I've made, whether it be in school, whether it be she's a dancer, whether it be through her dance. She also works as a professional model, whether it be through modeling. If she can always say, I'm proud of what I've done. I haven't compromised who I am as a woman in this world. I can show these pictures that I've posed for to 
anyone in my life and in my family and feel proud of who I am and what I've done. I feel like she is living her own empowerment. Right. She is owning who she is and dare I say even proud of who she is. She's, she's got this interesting sense of humility. And sometimes it's really difficult to have her say that she's proud of the work that she's done, um, which also I can just in my role in helping to raise young women have seen that that's a real challenge. So, so let's stop there and, and go back because I think there's a number of people who have their mouths dropped that you have a 20 year old daughter. So, oh um, so uh, wait till I tell you I have a 36 year old daughter as well. <laughs> So let's this, this, this not go there any longer. So yes. um, you also um, share a passion with me around having courageous conversations mm-hmm. and what that looks like. Um, yeah. you're, you're, you are very authentic in who you show up as um, in most cases. Mm-hmm. You're, you're being tame right now, today. Um, so, <laughs> say it again? I said that just means he cries a lot, but go on. <laughs> So, so tell me, why is it important for us as think about social justice? You talked about racial profiling earlier and the things that that um, people go through, um, especially in the black and brown communities. So, can you talk a little bit about why it's important for us to have these converse, these conversations, these difficult dialogues, as it were? Why? And why is probably not a good question. How come? No, 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 no. no, no. We're going to sit with that. Why? It's important because if, if we are to truly be the architect, then sharing our what, where, when, and then why are important. Knowing your why, and that's why I sat with why is important. Your why is your purpose. And if you know your purpose, then all of those things that you do after unfold, usually in a favorable way, not always. Mm-hmm. And so it's important to have these conversations, A, to, if we're looking at it from a qualitative and humanistic perspective, give voice. So if we're talking about agency, if we're talking about being the architect, there needs to be space and place for voice. But that dialogue and that conversation needs to be uh, robust. And what I mean by robust is more than just a group of black and brown folks sitting in a room having these courageous conversations. We need to be joined and um, physically have other folks who are not black and brown, when they say I stand with and I stand by, to stand with and stand by in those rooms. So I'll give an example. I have a really, we share a really dear friend, Dr. Sean Smith. Um, one year he did what I call his barnstorming year. For every ACES region, he submitted a proposal for courageous conversations, to my recollection. I could be wrong. And in a number of regions, those proposals were accepted. I was in the North Atlantic region and there was this dialogue and more people in that room were black and brown. And so my question always, I can't say always, my question is, is what stops other people from feeling like they're not invited to that conversation? And to truly move us forward as a profession, as a community, as a society, we've been saying it takes a village for a millennia. Did you answer the question? Say again? Did you answer that question? Did I answer which question? What makes other people not be in the room included in the conversation? Did you answer that question? What makes other people? What does that that answer for you? I want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly before I go running off with the mouth. So I'm going to ask you to ask me that question again. Well, you said that there are people in the room who are always having that conversation and others yes. don't want to be there or, or have not shown up in those spaces. Yes. So what I'm asking you is, have you answered that question as to why they aren't there? You asked that question. You I do you ask, don't know why I have answered that question in my mind. Okay, what is it? I'm afraid that I don't belong here. Could be one answer that some people say. Okay. I don't see my place here. Could be a response that other people say. That's and more of then, an excuse though, right? Say again, they That's could very well be a though, reason right? to be an excuse. And in some aspects, I am at a loss for words. Well, how do we, how can we allow that? Because it's in the truth of it all. Yes. They need to be in that room just as important. And, and the necessity of them being in that room is, is, is really 
germane to us making any progress. Um, I'm sorry, I spoke over you. Their no, presence is required. Their presence is required? I believe it is. If we are truly to have an experience where we move toward true equity, right. but there's fear in that. And are inclusive, our presence is required. But, but there there's has fear, to be a but there's fear. Yes, there's fear there. But what, so how come there's fear from one side and not the other to have this difficult? Oh, time? no, that's not true. And what I would say is, and I'll speak for myself, okay. I'm always fearful when I walk into those rooms. Why? Why? Because when I walk into those rooms, there are people who watch me walk into those rooms. And there are people who have thoughts and opinions about me when I walk into those rooms. And still I walk. And so well, my... It sounds like, you're saying, it's not like what you're saying is that they may stereotype you if you come across a certain way. Let's not act like that doesn't exist in this profession. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm just saying that's part of what you're thinking when you walk into that space. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't necessarily say for me it's a thinking rather of the, as opposed to a knowledge. There are people who will look at scholarship by certain people and say, well, you're doing some really myopic work. You know, if you're focusing on the issues of folks of color, students of color, doctoral students of color who are women, you know, you're doing some really myopic work if you're doing that. And so be careful because you don't want to pigeonhole yourself into that's all you can do. Um, those are words that I've heard. Those are words that I've heard personally. What, what is the problem with being pigeonholed in that area if, you, if there's work to be done? The problem is, is that there's the presumption that it's a pigeonhole. <laughs> so that, that's, a, that's a distraction. And it's work that needs to be done and to be explored. Right. When you look at what's happening across our profession right now, when you look at the special issues that many of the journals in the, in the ACA family are putting out, Okay. And looking to put out in terms of racist practices, anti-racist practices, um, counseling as a racist profession, counseling. When you look at the statement that the American Psychological Association put out, no matter what you think of it, they put that out. We can no longer afford or act like we live in a society where these things aren't or haven't been true. Forward movement, continued forward movement requires everyone involved. Hence the term, it takes a village. And I think what stops people is, I don't think that's my place. I think I should be more of a listener. And that is the antithesis of a courageous conversation. A courageous oh, conversation oh. means, hold on one second, much like my clients or anyone else's clients, when you cross that threshold into that room, you're right. fearful and yet you still walk. It's like right. Maya Angelou and still I rise. Okay, so what's the danger of not, of just sitting in and listening? What's the danger there? Danger of just sitting and listening is I'm gathering information that I'm not going to do anything about. Oh, wow. Okay. So what's the point of having all this knowledge? Because we say knowledge is power. Right. Right. What is the point of having all this knowledge to sit on it? Okay, so that's not social justice. It does. Social justice, counseling, in and of itself, the gerund, I-N-G, action-oriented. We are in, living in an, and operating in an action-oriented profession. Wow. You can thank Lynn Bohecker for that. We need to embrace that. And action-oriented requires walking or crossing a threshold, okay. sitting, giving voice, adding voice, asking questions. Mm -hmm. All of the things but we doing, ask. But ultimately doing. doing. Ultimately so having, ultimately doing. You are exactly right. And you then of course, there's happen. like, well, I don't know what to do. That's why we need to be in the room and be in I always ask that question. So what do you want to do? So when you say you don't know what to do, to me, that just says, that's a cop out in some regards, right? Because what do you want to do? Because we all see what's happening. We make choices. We see what's happening in the, in the Ukraine. We make a choice. We see what's happening in our politics. We make a choice. And so you know what to do because if you fell and skinned your knee, you would know what to do. So you have decision-making processes. So you can do it. You just choose not to. We may not like our choice, right. but you're absolutely right. We have choice. We have agency. And 
a part of our role is to help people begin to then enact that agency. And probing, what does that look like? That looks like me crossing the threshold. So as you cross that threshold, where are you sitting? Are you sitting in the back of the room where it's easy to escape? Done that before. Are you sitting in the middle where like you can be a little more involved? Or are you gonna take that one seat in the corner in the front on the left that nobody wanted to take? Nobody wanted so you to can take. be intimately connected to the discussion. All right, so listen, we're gonna answer those questions after the break. And so right. thank you for um, a very enlightening first part of our, our conversation together. Um, we're gonna take a quick break. This is the Voice of Counseling. I'm here with uh, Dr. Linwood Vereen and we'll see you in a moment. Counselors help positively impact lives by providing support, wellness, treatment. We're working to change lives. We are creating a world where every person has access to the quality, professional counseling, and mental health services needed to thrive. Welcome back to the Voice of Counseling from the American Counseling Association. I'm here with Dr. Linwood Vereen, and we've been talking about inclusivity, including people, having people come into the space and to have the very challenging conversations that are necessary for us to move forward as a people. So what does that say? How do we invite people in again, Linwood? What, what is it that we need to do? Oh, gosh. Um, we need to ask. We need to be inviting. We need to be encouraging. and need to be supportive. And we also, at the same time, need to be challenging. Because if we're truly in a profession where we value diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're part of a professional association that, that is the voice of counseling, hopefully there's an inherent, my space, I belong here. Okay. And then coupled with an, an affirmation and uh, an encouragement that, yes, please take the seat right next to me. I would love for you to sit next to me. I would love to engage in this dialogue. So when somebody else talks about their pain, those Linwood, and they're sharing authentically, it shuts down conversation sometimes. Um, yeah. how, do, how do we get past that? Because people need to not be so influenced by someone's story that they take themselves out of the equation. You do the things that you learned as a master's student and you don't get past it. You work through it. You work through it. Think about it. We're training students to sit across from people and work through life's speed bumps or whatever sort of uh, euphemism or analogy you use for what they're living with and living through. Why are we arrogant enough to absolve ourselves from living those same human experiences? We have pain, we have drama and trauma in our lives, even though we've had blank whatever level of training. Why are we absolving ourselves from being human and needing to work through? Because there's, there's, there's an excuse that comes up to mind, I think I hear it sometimes in those spaces, is that I didn't contribute to that. You I wasn't didn't. a part of that. So that's not who yeah. I am. But apathy today is a contributing factor. If you think about it, every late January, early February, when we're talking about Black History Month and Martin Luther King's birthday, there's that quote of, you know, injustice here is, you know, that, that right. threat. Right, it's right. the same thing across counseling. It's the right. same thing in these other spaces in our lives. Please, let's not act like that's not the case. Right. So let's stick with that in terms of a conversation. And let's bring in Black boys and men. That's where you're doing a lot of your work in. So how do uh, counselors keep that in mind, right? How do they really work through <laughs> working with African-American, Black, African descent um, men and um, boys? I think that's a great question. How do they? Both and. The both and is when I say this, I close my eyes and I think of the young men in my life, my nephew, my sons, um, other young men who I'm learning with, learning through, and also in in being mentored by. Um, how? Honesty, humility, 
Um, we talked earlier and you had brought up narrative inquiry. Um, when you look at certain things culturally, narrative inquiry and the art of storytelling are endemic to what I term as the black society. The use of humor, we, we, we wrote about that. The use of, and there are humor. It, it's a part of the art of storytelling. Yep. When I think of the people who are close to me in my life, I think each of us have shared a story about who is the orator in our family, the person who is the storyteller who then passes this down to the next generation, whether it's through a family Bible or through oral history, we are a culture and a community of storytellers. So as a counselor, if you wanna allow something powerful to um, occur, and it's not allow something powerful because that's presumptive. If you wanna provide a space, it's allow people to do what comes to them. And one is the art of storytelling and that's different than uh, storytelling that is deflective of what per a person is living through and experiencing. Right. Um, and so, you, you know, you brought up this article, you know, some, some of the work that we've done in the past, and it's been about how do you use humor as a point of storytelling? How can you use humor to work through, not avoid, pain, joy, strength, resilience, agency, all of those things? Well, how do you, and it is, how do you it is not only possible, it's fact. Well, when you, when you're not coming from a storytelling background, if that's not part of your history, how do you come to grips with that and understand how to use it? That is a great question. One of them is many programs, when they are training folks through theory, they use a postmodern lens. Postmodern lens lends itself to narrative inquiry. Narrative okay. inquiry is this has this unique and interesting synergy with the art of storytelling. Okay. I can remember once I was working with a group of young black students and I asked this question in a group setting, what are each of you going to do individually to teach us? What do you bring that I'm gonna learn from you? And you, there was this young man, I, he was sitting directly across me and I wish his face is just seared into my mind. His jaw dropped because it seemed like for the first time in his life, someone asked him, what do you have to teach me? What do you have to offer? And this young man who was 12 at the time ran with this idea of, I'm gonna teach this man something. And he was bold, he was brave. He was like, I need to sit down and let you do what you do. Absolutely incredible. Like I've been privileged to experience a really critical set of young men in my life behind me. There's this picture of this young man. Yeah, I see it. That is a self portrait that a young man created in the early nineties. He had never picked up a paintbrush in his life. He was at a facility for adjudicated youth and he was put in front of a mirror and then to his left, he had a canvas. And in a three week period, that is what he created. And that visualization is so powerful. I have carried this with me. It is always in my office, wherever I operate. It is so powerful because it is this beautiful visualization of this young black boy seeing himself as a young black boy possible to take it down off the wall and put it closer to the camera? I would, but there's some identifying information on there. Oh, okay, never mind. Um, never I could mind. black that out, I will. Um, no, 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 that's okay, that's that okay. I was, just, I was just more intrigued in seeing how the but imagery looks. Every time I look at that, I'm absolutely floored at his, like, his depiction of his eyes, his depiction of his skin, his depiction of his hair. And in all of that, I see this young boy growing into being a young man who is embracing every part of himself. He and that self-portrait is, I think how we want our clients to be, how we want our children to be, how we want to be unapologetic. Right, so have you followed his story? Excuse me? Have you followed his story? No, okay. because of time, circumstance and space, I have not had an opportunity to do that. There have been some youth who I've worked with who I've been able to, because they've chosen to reach out and stay in touch. Right, right. And this was one who didn't. Um, this is a young man who, I think at the age of 13, 12, said something that still stands with me. And it was, man, I think I need to have a kid because I need to leave something behind because he was under the assumption that he wouldn't live much longer. 
And so he was thinking about what a legacy that all the rest of us may take for granted. And so when I think about work with young black men, when I think about work with young uh, boys, black boys, it's how is it we provide a space for them to author and narrate their existence yeah. where they're challenged to be their complete and authentic self, supported and encouraged to be unapologetically honest about who they are and where they stand and who they see themselves as in the, in the world and how they feel other people see them in the world. Uh, and you asked how. The other how is we have a consistent literature that articulates a strengths-based perspective. Right. Dig for strengths, ask for, encourage, support a narrative where an individual can share. This is what I'm good at. This is what I have to offer. And embrace it. Allow them to embrace that within themselves. And mm -hmm. then our role as counselor, honor, mm -hmm. validate, support, nurture, encourage, push. Hmm. What does it look like on the other side? It depends on what other side you're talking about. When, when you, you said empower, that, uh, when you empower, when you allow them to embrace, you've seen it come to fruition. What does that look like? The word that comes to mind is joy. Hmm. When you said that, I see faces. Hmm. I see my nephew. Where did it take you? Yeah, I see you. Okay, never mind. I didn't even answer. You're fine. No, I see my nephew who, when he wrote his college application, his, his letter for application, he asked me to look at it. He is 17 years old and he was, he wrote things that I was like, are you sure you want to say this? And he said, yes. He asked me to help him wordsmith it. And I told him that I will do my best to try to not take away the essence of what he's saying. This letter had power. It was substantive. He talked about his strength, his resilience, what I've learned, what I'm good at. What this pandemic has done to my significant relationships, how I want them, how I deserve them, how I will take them. I, and I, when I read it, I called him. I was in tears about just how, like he was, and I, I, was, I was thousands of miles away and I just imagined him standing straight, tall. Um, I see the faces of my son. Um, I see the face of my future son. I see my friend, Michael Hannon. I see his son, Avery, who is this powerful young man. I see your daughter. I see all of these people in my mind. I see my other, I see my girls. I see strength. I see, I see an Ebony White. I see a Tice Nadrich. These people who stand, who hold their place. Uh, I see Alfonso Ferguson. I see David Ford. I see Ann Schillingford. A host of just beautiful, glorious people who live this, walk this, talk this. I see Kara Aiva, I see, I see her children. I see all of these things. When you ask this really simple question, like what does it do? Um, I see this space that allows an individual to stand in the space that they've earned, that they deserve, and they are more than willing to take and accept. And I see them willing to do that unapologetically in the face of all sorts of things in the face of discrimination, in the face of racism, in the face of injustice, in the face of, I will do more than just survive because of you. I will thrive because I am destined to. Those are the things I see. Very Linwood. Unfortunately, very Linwood. Fortunately, very Linwood. Fortunately. So, Fortunately, uh, yes. So, the word that you used was joy. Mm. And there's something within the Black community <clears throat> that hope, mm -hmm. that hope for a joyous future, a, a one in which 
I have become, I have evolved, I have arrived. Mm -hmm. um, all the suffering, all these things that I've gone through, there's a better day coming. Um, mm. I heard that in that word joy. That word joy is that it's we a better day here. Say that again. You said it's a better day coming. I can no longer afford to wait for a better day. Right, coming. right. But that's what I'm saying. In our community, there's this hope for a better day coming. Yes, consistently historically. And we, and, and we consistently say that out loud. There's the song, Glory, I use this in my presentation, that speaks to a better day coming, one day. Yes. But what I hear in what you're saying, you found that one day when you looked at those faces of mm -hmm. people I, when I who see are those there. Faces. When and I live those are the things experience. that are, you know, I think that we hold on to, right? We thrive through all of our problems and issues, racial profiling, social <laughs> injustices, barriers for that hope, that desire that it's going to change. Now, I don't want it in death. I do want it here and now. Yes. And it does come in that, in, that, in that package. But at the same time, there's this reality that we live in sometimes different Americas. Um, or different spaces in time because some people have much more influence or ability than others. And I'll let people figure out what that means. But, you know, so what is the role of ACA, right? When you think about all the stuff that we just talked about and you just shared, you, you were very vulnerable for folks. And I enjoy that. I believe in that because that lets people see the human side of who we are. Um, but what can ACA do? How can ACA become more human and as an association help with these anti-racism efforts? That's a good question. I'd say two things. So first, as I was listening to you, I was drawn to this idea. Um, this past year, like, I know you're a person who thinks of this, like people who we've lost over the course of any given time, space, and year. Um, this past year, Bell Hooks died. And she left an indelible mark, not only on our literature, but the world. And the mark that she has left to, for me is this idea. Of, and as I was listening to you, um, this idea in this frame of a home place, you know, when you were talking about struggle, when you were talking about uh, racial profiling, home place provides a space where an individual can rest, recuperate. Those are sort of rudimentary uh, definitions, but a place to just be to be nurtured, loved, and cared for. And so a part of what you know, we hope, and I have, I have some really unique colleagues uh, who have allowed me to participate with them in doing some work in looking at what that experience is like, um, the idea of home place, the idea of a place where one can be unapologetically themselves. And so the first thing I would want people to think about is go look that up. Go look at what Bell Hooks has shared with us about home place and then look at the scholarship because there is some, some growing scholarship around that, around what home place is and what it means. And so if you're really wanting to be a counselor who is looking at some alternative ways or interesting ways to be supportive, look at that and then think of the folks you're working with and their community, their families, the systems that they're in, in and around. What can ACA do? I think continue to acknowledge things that are fact and be honest and unapologetic and the things that they've done to be supportive of the emergence of professional counseling as this viable profession that helps thousands and millions, sometimes one person at a time, sometimes one couple or family at a time, one group at a time. That must continue. Uh, ACA can continue to support its family of journals, which I believe they will continue to do, to engender challenging, thoughtful, creative scholarship that continues to move our young profession forward. ACA how, do we move it, how do we move it away from just being in the journal to practice though? How do we make it practical? By challenging our research. Our research needs to, we're very good at studying ourselves. This is my opinion, it's not necessarily a fact. Right. And I think it's challenging those journals to now produce scholarship about the efficacy of counseling and the impact in community, which means we have to continue to shift our research. If we continue, we have to continue to shift our research through doing that research, which means we enter into communities. 
and do that work. So we're coming with real world knowledge and then we're putting that real world knowledge into journals and then bringing that to our classrooms and then really enacting the ING that's in counseling. Action oriented doing. The other part is continuing to acknowledge the role that maybe uh, acknowledging the role that ACA has played in perpetuating stereotypes. And own that, be honest with that, and then talk about the ways that ACA as the voice of professional counseling will do differently consistently moving forward. I think that's a great place to, for us to leave it. Uh, wow, you've said many things today, all of them profound. It has said many uh, things. I like the one, and I just, it just slipped my mind, but you say action oriented doing, what is, what is it again? ING is an action oriented gerund and professional counseling is simply that. Okay. Now we just have to live up to our mission, like live up action to who we are. Action oriented. Thank you, Dr. Linwood Vereen. I appreciate having you um, serve as one of our guests here on The Voice of Counseling, you have been very open, very honest, very vulnerable, and very moving, and I appreciate you. Thanks, Doc. I hope uh, to see you soon. We'll see each other soon. This has been The Voice of Counseling. I am Dr. S. Kent Butler. Uh, we'll see you next time. ACA provides these podcasts solely for informational and educational purposes. Opinions expressed in these podcasts do not necessarily reflect the view of ACA. ACA is not responsible for the consequences of any decisions or actions taken in reliance upon or as a result of the information and resources provided in this program. This program is copyright 2022 by the American Counseling Association. All rights reserved.